the Kurt Fiermetz lecture, uh, the Kurt Fiermetz distinguished <laughs> visitorship, I should say, was established in honor of the late Kurt Fiermetz, former vice chairman of J.P. Morgan, in recognition of his exceptional career in international finance and his dedication to the transatlantic relationship. The program was inaugurated in uh, 2008 to bring outstanding uh, U.S. individuals from the fields of finance and economics uh, to the uh, American Academy for an in-depth exchange with German colleagues, counterparts, and the interested public. And I should add that we have brought plenty of people who are also not economists, but among those uh, who have been here are uh, Secretary, former Secretary of the Treasury, Larry Summers, uh, who held the Fiermetz lecture, as did Fred Bergsten, uh, as has David Lipton. And among the non-economists, we've had Todd Stern, the former Special Envoy for Climate at the State Department, and Eric Schwartz, the former Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, uh, and I'm sorry, for uh, Population, Refugees, and Migration. <clears throat> Tonight, we are fortunate to have with us also uh, three of the program donors, and I'd just like to recognize them, Klaus Pohle, Klaus Löwe, and Stefan Naumann. Thank you so much for making this possible. So let me talk about our speaker uh, tonight for just one second. Uh, Doug Sosnick is one of the most influential political analysts in Washington. Uh, every one of his memos is a much-anticipated event uh, that inevitably gets summarized in Politico and elsewhere and then reverberates throughout the political um, arena. Now, part of the reason Doug has succeeded uh, so well in his work is that he understands the actual practice of politics supremely well. Uh, he started out running errands on campaigns while in college at Duke, and then he wound up being the driver for Chris Dodd, later a longtime senator from Connecticut, in his first campaign. Uh, as he told an oral history project, that's where I learned politics. And by the way, I encourage you all to look up that oral history project, which is online. It is really long, but there's an awful lot of great material in it. Um, Doug later rose to be Senator Dodd's chief of staff and eventually uh, went to work for the Clinton White House, uh, where he was in the innermost circle of political advisors to the president. Um, <clears throat> he was uh, a senior advisor to Bill Clinton for six years, and he played a key role in policy strategy uh, and communications uh, on, and all those decisions in the White House. And during this time, his titles include Senior Advisor for Policy and Strategy, White House Political Director, and Deputy for uh, Deputy Legislative Director. And perhaps some of you will ask what the difference was between all those jobs when we get to the Q&A. Um, <clears throat> more recently, Doug has been an advisor to um, senators, governors, uh, Fortune 100 corporations, foundations, and universities, and he's been doing this for uh, some time. His clients have included, and this, this is the part that really uh, impresses me, the National Basketball Association, because that's a well-run organization, uh, the Motion Picture uh, Association of America, um, which is um, one of the sources of our global power, uh, CNBC, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the University of North Carolina, despite the fact that he went to Duke, right? Okay. Um, he is the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Applebee's America, How, to Su How Successful Political Business and Religious Leaders Connect with the New American Community. <clears throat> so before I give the podium to Doug, let me just say a, a few words about the structure of the evening. Uh, Doug will talk for 20 to 30 minutes, and uh, then that will be followed by a discussion and Q&A, and if you're here, you know how to raise your hands to ask questions, and I expect there will be many. If you're joining via Zoom, uh, don't raise your hand. Uh, type your question in the Q&A part of the Zoom platform. Uh, I'm, I apologize in advance if we don't get to all your questions. Doug, thank you so much for coming. God, listening to this situation in American politics, I thought he was talking about Paraguay or some third world country. Um, that was a really nice introduction. Uh, uh, the answer to your question about the titles was I was in the intersection of 
public policy, politics, communications, and scandal. And that's how I spent six years. Um, so business was booming in the White House. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, start, let me start by saying what I'm not going to do tonight is try to have you feel like you're watching cable television. I'm going to try to what I call explain the unexplainable, which is what's going on, what, what's the why? Why is what's going on in American politics happening? And uh, what does it mean for the election? And so I'm going to try to cover uh, <clears throat> four areas. Um, one is the, uh, what are the underlying causes of what's going on in America that has gotten us to where we are today? Um, the second is, uh, what is the political impact of that? Uh, the third is, what is the mood of the country as we get ready for the election next year? And then lastly, I will touch on the, the election coming up uh, and, and what to watch for. And um, uh, I know that the world is suffering from PowerPoint fatigue. Um, I, got a, I got a big nod there. Uh, so I have a PowerPoint, and I'm going to try to go through it as quickly as possible because the longer I'm talking at you, uh, the less you're going to want to hear that. And then in the Q&A, if I can find an excuse to use my slides, um, then it's on your dime. Um, so just one last thing. So when people ask me about the 2024 elections, I always say to understand the 2024 election tree, you can't look at a tree and understand it. You've got to look at the forest. And so what I want to do is talk about the forest of what we're living in and taking a step back. We are – I'm going to restri restrict it right now to America – I believe it probably transcends into Europe and other places, but I'll leave that to you all as how much I'm saying about what's going on in America relates to what's going on in Germany. But what's going on in America is we're going through the biggest transformation in our country since the late 1800s when we went from an agrarian society to an industrial society. And we are now moving from a top-down manufacturing economy, uh, 20th century, to a 21st century digital and global one. And like the preceding transformation that happened uh, from an agrarian society that took 30 or 40 years of transition before we moved from one era to another economically. And there, particularly in the beginning, there are small groups of winners and a lot of losers on that. And so we're in the middle of this transformation, uh, which I think began in the early 1970s, which was the beginning of the decline of the middle class uh, in America. Uh, and there are the, the, a lot of the losers in the middle class were people that had manufacturing jobs, no college, uh, had a you know, good income. They had a, you know, I worked in Michigan and um, when I first ran a campaign in the early 1980s, and you know, guys were working on the lines at, at G GM, and they had a house, and they had a cabin up north, and a boat. These are the people who have been eviscerated by this transformation. And so, what they call this transformation is is a hinge moment in history. If you think about it piece of metal holding two pieces of wood. We're in the middle of this hinge moment of going from one era to another. And it's like, you know, you're in a boat going down the rapids. It's pretty unpleasant. Um, but I want to pull you back so that as you look at what's going on uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I think if you have the context for that, you might have more of an understanding. So this is since the beginning of the century. We've had 10 elections, 12 election cycles, 10 of which the countries voted against whoever's in power. Um, <clears throat> this shows you the decline in trust in government. Going if, On the top left was the day before John Kennedy was assassinated. And you can look at a 50-year decline uh, in trust of government. Um, uh, and then you look at the decline of institutions. If you start on the left here, 2021, uh, you can see there are only three institutions in our country that people had over 50% trusted. And if you want to go to the right, you can see that in the last couple of years post-COVID, the numbers continue to go down. This is a, most people think our institutions in our country are one of two things. They're either broken or they're corrupt. And this creates an environment um, for people like Donald Trump uh, to step forward. If there's one thing I can leave you with tonight, Donald Trump did not cause what's going on in America. He is a symptom of what's going on in America. A hundred years from now, when, when people look back at this period of time, they're not going to be looking at Donald Trump. They're going to be looking at trying to understand how a person like Donald Trump could become president. And, and so if you look at the, my God, if you look at, uh, you know, Congress and if you go from the bottom up, you know, if I ever go anywhere in the world, and I want to know what kind of society you have, I want to know what the criminal, I want to know if the courts are independent and, and what people think of them. 
And that's the single best clue as to what kind of society. When in our country right now, you can look at how alienated the majority of, I mean, 18% of the people have confidence in the criminal justice system. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's the totality of alienation. Um, so <clears throat> there's an old saying, well, what's good for General Motors is good for America. And the saying was basically the more cars that General Motors sold, the better it was for Americans. So what happened beginning in the 1970s was the decoupling. If you look at the 70s and before, if you look at, at, at labor productivity, GDP growth, employment, and wages, they all went up and down together. But the decoupling began, and this is the, 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 the carving out of the middle class, the decoupling began in the late 70s, early 80s, where as GDP growth and productivity went up, wages and, um, and income uh, were decoupled from that. And we began, um, we have what I call in America kind of like wild, wild west capitalism. We had no, we had no guardrails. And, uh, <clears throat> but if you take uh, the second most read academic paper, I don't know, I don't know if it's current now, but several years ago, the second most academically read paper uh, in the history of the worldwide internet, as Bill Clinton would say, um, was an article by a professor at Harvard named Jensen who wrote about shareholder capitalism, which is from the Tom Friedman School. And so in the mid-70s and into the 80s, our entire economic uh, uh, priorities w was the benefit to the shareholders. And so what does that mean? Well, that means everything's tied to quarterly income, to quarterly earnings, executive pay, start the gap between the, the CEOs and workers went from like 11 to one to like 100 to one, uh, offshoring, uh, you know, globalization and trade. And, and so uh, and no investment in R&D because that's, that's a lot of money, and, you know, that brings stock prices down. So this began a process of accelerating the decline of the middle class. Which is, as you see now, 1971, 61% of the country, according to Pew, was middle class. And by 2021, that number was down to 50. And if you also look to the right, you can see that the upper income went from 14% of the country to 21% of the country. And then if you look on the right of the screen about you know, where the money is, you can see now the lines have crossed and that the upper income now far exceed the, the, middle, the, uh, the middle income. If you look at 1970, Look at where we were, uh, that tells you a lot about where we are. So there's an old saying in American politics, all politics is local. And the, the, the theory of the case was, which was really the coin of the realm for 50 years, was the way you get elected off it for, to office uh, is you take care of your local constituencies and their local concerns. And that's how you got elected. Well, now all politics is national. So <clears throat> this is an old slide now because we just had an election in Louisiana this past weekend. There are now 40 states where one party has complete com control of political power. 40 states. And in over half of those states, they have veto-proof majorities. And so all politics is now national. How you vote for presidents, how you vote for Senate, how you vote for House, how you vote for, for mayor, how you vote for state legislatures. So you can see there are 45 states have voted the same way in the last two elections. <clears throat> there are only five senators now of a different party than the presidential candidate. When I was doing politics in the 1980s, over half the senators were from a different party. There are only, there are only 20, uh, 23 members of the House from a different party, 94%. So all politics is now national. This is, what you, this is tribal politics. So what's the tell? How do you know where someone lives, how they vote? Well, the, the single best tell is education. And Democrats perform well, and the higher the educated the area, the better they do. And the lower the educated the area, the more the Republicans uh, do well. And so if you see on the bottom, all those red dots is, is, uh, is, is how the, is, is the party that controls the state. So it's either red, purple, or blue. And then if you look at the top, you can see all that well-educated people tend to support Democrats. And so if you look in the middle, um, that's where the predominant uh, purple states are. And those are the people, those are the states, which I'll show you in a few minutes, that are in the middle of the education levels. So it's only in those states that, um, uh, that really have competitive politics at this point. So this was Trump's favorite map. Now this is the, um, this is the 2020 map, but it mirrors the 2016 map. So we have a real, we had a realignment in American politics that, as I mentioned earlier, 
always remember, politics is a lagging indicator of a society. It's not a leading indicator. So in the 1970s, you began the decline of the middle class. It first showed up in politics in the early 1990s when Ross Perot got 19% of the vote in 1992. Trump didn't, as I said earlier, create this environment. In fact, the line had formed. He just got in the front of the line and he accelerated the completion of these trends that had the seeds back in the early 1970s. And so as a result, he carried 84% of the counties in the United States. He had this map, he had, the, he had the 2016 version in the White House. He had this map outside the Oval, and he, he always shows people this. He says, America loves me. I, I went everywhere. Um, and he did carry 84% of the counties. But the, the, the only 16% the of the counties that Biden carried is where 70% of the GDP growth in America came from. So it's the fault line of who are winners and losers in the new economy, and the best tell on that uh, is education. So, let's see, I'll go back here for a second. Oh yeah, so in 2008 and 2012, there were 206 counties voted for Obama. They voted for Obama in both elections. And then in 2016, 206 counties voted for Trump. And then in 2020, Biden only won back 25 of them. So who are these people? Well, they are disproportionately older, white, non-college people. And if you look at where they live, a lot of that was in the, the core part of the industrial economy of the, of the 20th century um, that, that, that had been replaced by a 21st century digital and global one. So this just shows you that the Democrats have become more the party of the highly educated. The top line, you can see, you know, going back to, uh, let's see, why don't you go back, let's see, we can go back to, um, you know, the 1980s, for instance. Uh, well, at, or, uh, yeah, you can start seeing the decline. Uh, 1990, I mentioned earlier about the Perot vote, 19 million people. But you see that, that line that go, is going down, those are non-college whites. And you can see that they started abandoning the Democrats in droves in 1990. And you can see the steady growth of white college uh, people um, um, supporting the Democrats. And this is just another way of looking at the decline of Democrats among, uh, this is non-college educated uh, people of color. So this is increasingly not just a black white thing. If you are non-college, um, Hispanic, for instance, particularly Hispanic male, you're increasingly voting for Republicans and you're increasingly voting for Trump. So first is education and second is density. You tell me how densely populated an area is, I'll tell you how they're going to vote. And the blue line on the right, the further you go to the right, the more densely populated the area is. So you can see on the right, how when you get to the most densely populated area, they're overwhelmingly voting for Democrats. There's not a single congressional district in the United States, 435 districts. There is not a single urban district in the United States that's competitive politically. Um, and if you look uh, down on the, um, on the red line, as you, as you, on the top part of the chart on the left, you see that less densely populated they are, how overwhelmingly they vote for Republican. So, and, and so can, in, in American cities, there are only two people who, who live in American cities now, the people who can afford to live there and the people who can't afford to leave. And that's all you got left. And so then as you start moving from the urban areas to the suburban ring, the closer you're in the suburban area, um, the, the more money it costs to live there because you don't want to spend all day driving. And those are more densely populated. So those are more, and they're higher educated people. So as you move out, from an urban area is the further you move out and the less densely populated the area, the more likely that area is to vote Republican. And so you can see on the left how the, these lines have changed in terms of density. So you basically you tell, me, you tell me the density of an area, you tell me the education of an area, and I'll tell you how they're going to vote. What I did not do, um, what, what I have done in the past is I've put the Brexit vote and the last presidential election in France up there and I said, I don't know anything about any of this stuff, but I can tell you who's, who lives where. Because how people voted on Brexit 
in terms of the cuts, is the same way they vote in the United States uh, uh, in our politics now, which is the same divide, the education divide. So the mood of the country, uh, I, you know, I'm not sure. Dan said the economy is booming. I think he said that. But anyway, the, most people in America don't think the economy is all that hot. So, so when I give um, these talks, I can't. I'm, I'm comfortable showing you charts that are um, um, <coughs> a few years old if it's after the realignment. But I can't go up here and show you a, a nine-month-old chart, a nine-month-old poll, because you look at me and say it's an old poll. But the dirty little secret is, I, don't, I can show you a two-year-old poll, and it's as current as the current poll. So for the last, since two years ago, uh, uh, the country is over 70% has said we're headed in the wrong direction for two years. And then if you look at the driver here, um, you can see that you know, the, the drop in consumer confidence, which is, so remember, the uh, majority of Americans have never lived through an inflationary period. The last inflationary period we have is in the early 1980s. The majority of Americans either weren't alive or weren't old enough to remember what it was like. So this is a new thing for people. And inflation touches you and sears you in a, in a way that not, no other economic malice does. And so it's got a huge psychological impact and effect that you're reminded of 10 times a day when you go about your business. So. Uh, then gasoline prices, which is really the best predictor, you can see how how they went up, and now they've been tricking up, trickling up again, which is poison for Biden and the Democrats. So this is another issue that this issue of abortion is is going to be that it's an important issue today. It'll be a more important issue tomorrow. It'll be a more important issue five years from now. Gallup has done abortion polling um, since the '75. This is the highest total of support for some level of a woman's right to choose, 75 percent. It's the highest level they've ever had in their polling. We had six states last year that had referendum. So rem remember, uh, take a risk here. So um, let's see. So those red states, they can do anything they want. No one can stop them. So when the Supreme Court came down, with their Roe versus Wade decision, in these red states, they went and said, we're going to codify this at a local level. And so you've had six abortion ballot initiatives in the last year. Red states like Kentucky and Montana, it doesn't matter. Every single one of them overwhelmingly voted to preserve a woman's right to choose, even in Republican areas. And so, and this is a very, the fact that while we have divided dysfunctional government in Washington, we have highly functional government in the states, whether you like it or not. And that's a very sort of non-virtuous relationship between what happens in Washington and what goes on in the states. So this issue of abortion is, is one of the most important issues uh, in terms of driving politics. And of course, uh, there's a correlation with educated voters uh, in particular um, on, on this issue. So this is, um, this is the ugliest chart here. So this is, this is the chart that Democrats don't understand. So this is social conservatism going up high, social liberalism going down low, and um, fiscally liberal, which is basically, you know, I'd call that uh, populist, because there's really you don't believe in anything except spending money and stuff, right? Um, I tell people I've been in politics so long, I remember when Republicans were fiscally responsible. Um, that's no longer the case. But the point is, this, the, the, the money box here is the top left. And what that tells you about America, which is a center-right country, is that we're pretty socially conservative and always have been. Um, and, and that's what part of the problem when you have a Democratic Party that's controlled by elites, that that doesn't represent the majority of Americans. And what Trump says out loud is what a lot of people think. And he's created a permission structure now to be able to say out loud and not look at your shoes about how offended you are by wokeism. And you know, so as a Democrat, I've advised a lot of companies. And during a lot of the last couple of years, there's um, been a lot of pressure on companies to 
uh, to speak out on social issues, which I have advised against as a Democrat. And remember, CEOs are disproportionately college-educated people who go to the country club on Saturday night, and what do you think they talk about? And what do you think when, that, when, when the CEO comes, their kids come home from college, what do you think they're hearing around the dining room table? So there, and, and, uh, Gallup came out this week, uh, only 41% of the country thinks that, that corporations and CEOs should speak out on social issues. It's an eight-point drop from a year ago. So this is a reminder, uh, which is why Trump can win, uh, how important it is to not lose track of America being a center-right country. So here we go. This is the election no one wants. Um, <laughs> that's one thing we can agree on in America is we're, too, we're tired of these old guys. And I'm going to try to explain to you how we got here. Mm. So, um, so uh, again, basically, so there's an architecture to this tribal politics. It's around 45% of the country is crazy left wing, 45% is crazy right wing, and 10% thinks the left wing and the right wing are crazy. And so, so Trump never got to 50% of the vote as president, job approval. He, he vacillated between 40% and like 48%. When he was at 48%, and this is a dirty little secret about Donald Trump, a lot of his policies, particularly say China, a lot of his policies are really quite popular. And there are a lot of, you know, Biden's different than Trump, and he certainly believes in diplomacy, and he like, understands history, and, you know, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> but, but he's not different than Trump on a lot of issues. And the reason why is because those issues are popular. So when Trump is up at 48, he's talking about the issues. And when he's down at 40, it's when he's talking about his creepy stuff. But, but, he, but he vacillated in that window. And now Biden is in that same window. And what happened was, you can see in, uh, in August, uh, or July, it began of 21. You can see before that that Biden's job approval was higher than Trump's had ever been. But the lines crossed. And the re what was the reason why? The reason why was several fold. One, he did a South Lawn event on the 4th of July and declared COVID over. And we'd be back as a country, back to work after Labor Day. They didn't really work out too well. Um, secondly, was the uh, Afghanistan withdrawal in August. And then September was the first month that inflation ticked up to over 6%. And also in September was the first time we started having supply, su supply chain pr uh, problems. So by about now, the lines crossed. And essentially, Biden is in the same zone as Trump. So this is the 10th quarter first term president's job approval. So I'll give you a pro tip. Anytime you're on a slide next to Donald Trump and Jimmy Carter, that's not a good sign. And, um, and so they didn't get reelected. And this is where Biden is. Now, George H.W. Bush at the top had terrific numbers, but that was right after the Gulf uh, incursion. So he had an artificial level. So Biden's job approval is in this um, <coughs> level um, that by old politics uh, is uh, is a death wish. So there's a poll. I'm going to come back to this in, at the end about what to watch for. So there's a poll in the Wall Street. Uh, this, is, so this is a Marquette poll, and it was about three weeks ago. And this was a question of, okay, do you like things under the Trump presidency or the Biden presidency? Now, if I were back in the White House in my old job, this would give me tremendous heartburn. If you look at um, from the left to right, Trump is killing on the economy, immigration, which is a big issue. But, but I would say... Americans are worried about their security. They're worried about their personal security and safety, and they're worried about their economic security. And Democrats do not understand both the symbolic and real power of immigration. And when people in our country uh, are much more sympathetic and open to immigration when times are good, and when times are bad, they're very xenophobic. Uh, and you can also see, that obviously, inflation and job creation. I mean, that, that's brutal uh, for Biden. And then you get to the second tier, of the abortion I mentioned earlier. Um, the what they did not ask, um, which I think is a real driver issue, is democracy um, and how important that is. Uh, it was a big, had a big impact on Democrat success in 2022 midterms. I mean, my whole life, I never thought democracy would be on the ballot. Uh, it will be next year. So, 
uh, it, as I've tried to show you all the way up till now, most of the country, it doesn't matter what they think, they're spoken for. There are at most only eight states, and I'm being generous, there are probably six, but these purple states are the only states that matter in determining the outcome of the election. Biden won California and New York by more votes, 7.2 million, I think, by more votes than he won the entire national vote by. So I'll come back to this in a minute. So if you look on, <coughs> these are the eight states by election results. Remember now, in these 42 states, if I showed you 16, 18, 20, 22, they're all either red across or blue across. These are the only places where you see activity going back and forth or purple. And the key slot, part of the slide is on the right, which is the education levels. And so what they have in common, as I mentioned earlier, is that these states, except for uh, Nevada, which I think is an opportunity for Trump because of, they have such a high level of, of, of non-college voters, and New Hampshire, which a lot of people don't think are competitive. But if you look at all the rest of them, they're all dead square in the middle on education levels. And that's the reason that they're still competitive. So how did we get to Trump and Biden? People ask every day. So the answer is Trump is probably going to be the nominee because of the base of the party. And they support him. Biden is going to be the nominee, assuming he gets there, uh, because the elites have decided to take the bet on him. Not the base, but the elites. And if you look at why you're voting for Biden or Trump, if you look on the left, you can see that the overwhelming percentage of people voting for Biden are voting for Biden as a vote against Trump, not a vote for Biden. And on the other hand, on the right, you can see that, that the Trump voters are voting for Trump. And the one thing you need to understand about Trump uh, other than the fact that, um, uh, you know, how he got here uh, and that he's a reflection, not the cause of what's going on, uh, is the fact that he is, in fact, the leader of a political movement. And a political movement is different than a campaign. A movement is bigger than a campaign. And since World War II, I think Obama, for the first three or four years, was probably the only other political movement we had in America. And the movement that supported Obama was really more about an ideal and sort of an aspirational sort of belief in him. Uh, Trump is, is, a, is a movement, but it's based on policies, and it's based on identity. And, um, you know, there's kind of a, um, I'm trying to figure out the right way to say this doesn't come out wrong, there's kind of a joy to the anger of a Trump rally. And people come there for 12 hours. <laughs> And it's a lifestyle, and it's an expression of who they are. It's not going to hear some guy give a political speech. So that's great news for him in a primary. It could be more problematic in a general election. So this is, I'm not going to go through this. On the, on the bottom is, is the dates for Trump's trials, and the top is the political calendar. And I, you know, I, I, I stay on top of this stuff, right? I can't keep it straight. He's got 91 counts right now. But the key thing on this chart is around Super Tuesday in the middle. Um, Trump is uh, on track to wrap up the nomination uh, uh, right around, right after Super Tuesday. And that's about the point where you're just going to start moving into the sweet spot of when these trials start. Um, so I'm going to uh, end on a couple quick notes here. One is... Um, uh, just in summary, you watch the eight states, the six states. If I came back, if I'd been gone and just checked in next October, so I was like, I want to get, to, I want to, get to ask two questions. And then, but by asking those questions, I'll know who's going to win the election. The first is, what is the, uh, what's the polling in these states? Tell me what's going on in Arizona, Wisconsin, Nevada, Georgia, Pennsylvania. If I know what's going on in those states, I'm going to tell you what the outcome of the election is. The other thing that I want to know is what's this election about? If this election is about a referendum on Joe Biden and what kind of job he's doing as president, it's going to lose. If this 
campaign is a choice between the Biden presidency and the Trump presidency, at least right now, Biden's going to lose. If this campaign is a referendum on Donald Trump, then Biden will probably win. And uh, if you if you look from so Trump, uh, we're talking at dinner. Trump got elected in 2016 largely uh, because of Hillary Clinton. People came out to vote against Clinton. There were, uh, I think it was around 17 percent of the people that on election day had a negative view about Trump and a negative view about Clinton, and he he overwhelmingly carried those voters um, getting elected. Um, but since then. Uh, the Republicans have lost with Trump. They've lost the White House. They've lost the House. They've lost the Senate. Uh, and they got the table was run uh, in 2022. And so if the election is about Trump, um, then he'll probably lose. And the bet that the Democrats have made is it's bigger risk. So the bet in 2020 was Joe Biden was the only person that could beat Trump. Joe Biden was dead in the water, and they came uh, from <clears throat> one of the previous speakers here last week. There was a two-week period where the Democrats, we were like pretty sure we're going to nominate Bernie Sanders for president. And we had, a, as a party, you have these chemical reactions in a primary. And so everyone coalesced around Biden uh, because they thought he's the only person that could beat Trump. And as it turned out, they were right. Because... As bad as Trump did and did everything wrong, uh, he almost won. And so the bet that the Democrat elites are making right now is it's a bigger risk to see someone else who runs not knowing who it is, and they're going to take the bet on Biden. And the last thing I'll say, which uh, I always like to leave my audience with an unsettled feeling. Um, so uh, I, I mentioned earlier that um, uh, you know, the, 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 vote for, uh, the vote for Biden was really not a vote for Biden. It was a vote against Trump. Biden was the first pres person to get elected president uh, since George H.W. Bush in 1988 without a political base. He got, in 88, he got elected essentially to a Reagan third term. Biden got elected in 2020 uh, without a political base, or I guess his political base was anti-Trump voters. Trump... I don't think there's anyone in the history of the United States who got elected president owing fewer people than Donald Trump. He didn't have a campaign. He didn't have bundlers. He didn't have fundraising. He'd never done this stuff before. And he won the election all by himself. And then he went into the White House. And as I think you've seen, he, I would say he's not a student of history. And he doesn't really understand government or respect government. But he's a quick learner. And he is running an extremely sophisticated campaign for president right now. And he already has made plans that if he gets reelected, he knows exactly what he's going to do when he's president. And he's already got teams on that. And he will be far more effective. Put aside whether you like Trump or don't like Trump. He will be far more effective in pursuing his agenda if he gets reelected than he ever did in his first term. And there are large numbers of people. There are 7 million people, more people voted for Trump in 20 than 16. What do you lost? 7 million more. There are a large number of people um, in these purple states who fit the demographic profile of someone who doesn't vote, but if they do vote, they're going to vote for Trump. So I would not underestimate his potency in a general election. So I think that's probably depressing enough. I think on that note, uh, we'll do your Q&A. So thank you all very much uh, for your time. Every time you look at the clips uh, from another Trump rally, you're kind of, maybe not you, I'm astonished by the bizarro things he says, which are, you know, completely insane. I mean, talking to Tucker Carlson about whether Jeffrey Epstein was killed or not is like, you know, a major deal. And then he, you know, he starts talking about the Panama Canal it is very hard for me to believe that there are uh, votes in the middle that he is going to pick up and that at the end of the day, everyone's just going to say, he's just too damn crazy. There's, um, uh, you're going to show me why I'm wrong. So, oh, oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, um, so is, this not a, is this not a legitimate way to look at it? Well, 
Yeah, but it depends on like. Remember, like forty-two states don't matter, and and eighty. I mean, it depends how you want to do the math. Eighty-eight percent of the people, what they think, don't matter, and it's the twelve percent in the right states that do matter. And I showed you earlier. First of all, they've already priced in all this crazy stuff about Trump. They already know that, and they've already priced it in the product. And if you look at like, which I'm not going to show you now. Uh, if you look at like, well, when Trump was president, how did you feel about the economy? All this stuff, pricing it in, it's like, you know, he made my life better. At least how they feel right now. And um, uh, so they're, they, they're, they're, the people in the middle are looking past all of that. And part of the problem Biden has is he said, no, let me president and I'll bring life back to normal. That's what he said, right? Bring the adults back in the room. Well, you know, the adults are overrated. And, you know, they kind of like, at least right now, are like thinking, well, you know, this isn't like all that normal. Uh, and it's like, it's actually like worse. So they can get to the point where, yeah, he's, you know, so, so they had some article once that came out about Trump didn't pay any taxes. Made all this money to pay any taxes. So the interviewers like going to corner him in the room. And so Trump says, yeah, I didn't pay any taxes. Yeah, only a fool pays taxes. I mean, give me a break. And people understand that. Hillary would give them a long speech about taxes and all this crap, and they look at it like, what a phony. And so, so Trump is, you know, he's just, he's just out there, and they've already priced that in. Um, but I do believe, and you saw it in 2022, and that's why the, the abortion issue is such an potent issue, that, uh, that people do see the price of crazy. And um, so, you know, I'll give talks on politics. Um, I, 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 I couldn't literally service all the people both before the 2020 presidential and the three or four months after. All the companies, and I, there, it was impossible for me to accept all my invitations. People are tuned out to politics. They can't stand any of it. They don't like any of these people. They're beginning to, like, you know, want to hear from me. Because they have to, but but people are like totally checked out on all this stuff, and they think that uh, you know Biden is too old, he's not up to the job, and they think that Trump is crazy. Um, uh, but I do think the issue of democracy, which I alluded to earlier, could be decisive. Um, uh, in the 2022 midterms, there around 14 percent of the people had a negative opinion of Biden job approval, 14% who voted for Democrats because they're voting against Trump and the crazy and they don't like Biden. But Biden has got to improve his position um, so that he's acceptable. And right now, they'll, they're willing to sacrifice a little of Trump's crazy stuff if we can get back to the economic condition that we were in in 2019. So I, I want to ask you why you think <coughs> Biden's ratings are so low because, first of all, the, the, in the industrialized world at least, and maybe it doesn't matter how you compare, the U.S. has the best economy going. That's number one. He's had an enormous legislative record, um, including you know two bills that are just staggering in historical comparison to everything since the New Deal in terms of spending on infrastructure and, and uh, energy and climate and all the rest, creating tons of new jobs, um, and it makes you wonder if it isn't, you know, the advent of social media or something that has just created bubbles that say, Joe Biden's a loser. So, I, by the way, this whole thing about, like, we have this problem in our country because of TV and cable and social media, that's a symptom. That's not the cause. That's a reflection of the problem. That's not the problem. So I would say, and I'll tell you a quick Clinton story, I would say there are four problems that uh, Biden has. Uh, one is uh, they did a lousy job of setting the table when they took office about how much trouble the country was in. They did a really bad job of that. And they also did a really bad job of depoliticizing. They did not try to depoliticize COVID. They actually politicized COVID which created this tribal politics. So that's the first problem. The second problem is they didn't have a clear narrative of what they were doing and why for the country. 
And so and Dan and I were at the White House for Clinton in 93 and 94, and we got all this stuff done, and everything was going great, and then we had the midterm elections, and we had Democrats had the worst performance since World War II, and it was the first time the Republicans took the House back um, since the 1950s. And we'd done all this great stuff for America, and, like, why did we get punished? So we did a focus, we, <coughs> we, we did a focus group of Clinton giving a speech in Iowa, and the focus group said... Hey guys, the average person in America is going to lose, is going to change jobs eight times. Um, when, you, when your father, probably father, when your father had a job, previous generation, they got hired by a company, and they had security for a job for, for the entire, entirety of their career. You're now though, going to change jobs eight times. So we figured out that that, like, first of all, we didn't tell a story, and secondly, we told a story that made people nervous. So we changed our story. We changed our story to this is the greatest country in America, in the world. Only in this country now can you achieve whatever you seek to achieve. The average person will change their jobs eight times in their lives. Sky is now the limit for you, as opposed to your father who got a job and was trapped there for their entire life. So that shows you that, and, and Trump understands language. He trademarked the day after 2012 election, make America great. And then he's fussing around for about nine months, and he said, you know, that's not quite right. So then he trademarked again. And so he has a clear narrative. So Biden's, Biden has not had a, second thing, so Biden has not had a clear narrative, but people don't understand what they've been doing and why. Then the third problem is um, it takes a long time to figure out a problem, get it solved legislatively, implement the change, have people feel the change, and have people go back to a pollster and say, I feel the change. That, that's, a, that's the five-step process that takes a long time. And the more you have a failure of uh, a narrative, uh, the more likely you are to fall in that Iowa trap I described about our inability to have a narrative and to have a narrative that didn't work. And the last thing I'll say is a reporter friend of mine was uh, in the uh, Reagan White House with Mike Deaver one night around 6.30, and that's where, back in my, when we were in the White House, the world stopped at 6.30 because it was the evening news, and everyone watched the evening news, and then the newspapers were right off of that, and that was, we'd go home at 7, and no one would page us or text us, and we'd just start the next day. So those were really important, right, the evening news. So mostly CBS and New York Times. So the New York Times reporter's in there with um, Deaver, and they watched this piece, the lead piece on Reagan that night. It was a horrible piece. And when it was over, the reporter like, looked at uh, Deaver and didn't know what to say. So he finally said, How do you, you know, that's pretty bad. What do you think? And Deaver said, oh, that was awesome. And the reporter said, that was awesome? He said, yeah, did you see those pictures? No one, looks at the, no one listens to the words. All they do is see the pictures. So Biden's fourth problem is the picture. Walk, watching him walk, watching him perform. He doesn't have the power of the bully pulpit. Um, and so that is the fourth reason of why those factors together of why his polling numbers are where they are. <laughs> um, <clears throat> why are... Um, non-white voters drifting away from the party of, you know, the ethnics, mm -hmm. civil rights, uh, social benefits. Mm -hmm. So there's several reasons. Let's start with, like, the migration to America in the early 1900s by Italians and Irish and other groups. They came to America self-identifying with where they came from, the Irish vote, the Catholic vote. Well, as, as generations assimilate into America, they start identifying more with where their station is in life and not their ethnicity. And so for non-college, non non-whites, Hispanics in particular, they don't think of themselves as Hispanic. And you, you want to ask, you look at polling of like who f is most concerned about crime and immigration? It's the people who are directly impacted on a daily basis. 
And it's, and it's a lot of working class Hispanics and a lot of working class blacks who feel it more than anybody else. And so when you go to suburbs, suburbs are the only, there are only like four groups, I didn't mention it, I just, there are four groups you want to watch, three or four groups you want to watch to see how they vote in terms of figuring out the outcome of the election in those states. I want to look at Republicans, about 20% that hate Trump. Independent voters, about 40% of the people in 2022 who voted in Arizona, 40% of them said they're self-identified independents. Third is I want to look at um, college-educated men, white men, who had been voting Republican their whole lives. They went for Biden in 2020, and they went back to Republicans in 2022. Uh, and the last are non-college white women. So those are the people I want to see the cuts um, uh, and the last is, is working class, and I showed you the chart. Um, but, but, you know, working class Hispanics live in suburbs. That's where the swing voters are. And their neighbors are, 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 are like them in terms of their station in life, and they identify with their neighbors, which is one of the reasons people self-select where they live, which is one of the reasons we have tribal politics, which is one of the reasons that 42 states don't matter in politics because people are choosing to live around people who think like themselves. But, but non-white people who live in these neighborhoods think like their neighbors, and their neighbors are of all races. That's the, the, the suburbs are, are the only place left in America that's diverse by race. The cities are not, and the rural areas are not. So they self-identify with their peer groups, and it's not driven by their ethnicity. Last question, and then we'll open it up. Um, how do you uh, <clears throat> situate inequality as being one of the driving forces in this disastrous situation? Well, so I'm going to talk about inequality in two ways. One is, um, uh, so I talked about the decline of the middle class starting in the early 1970s. <laughs> I think there was a second factor which led to this division in America, uh, and it was the Vietnam War. But it wasn't the Vietnam War in the way that people talk about the Vietnam War. It was the Vietnam War was the first time that we're not, as a country, all in this together. It was the first time that people with money and power started getting treated differently than people without money and power. And then you see the decline of the middle class, which I showed you, and the rise of the upper income people. You know, they asked Willie Sutton why he robs banks. He says, I rob banks because that's where the money is. And if you, look at, you know, if you look at how you made a fortune in America after World War II, is you sold to the middle class. Well, now only a fool sells to the middle class. People do what, Billy, what Willie Sutton did. They sell to people who have money. So if you look at um, just when you travel, self-selecting this room, I'm making a few presumptions here. You, look, you think about your travel experience and how you get to the airport. When you get to the airport, what security line you go through based on paying for extra, based on where you sit on the plane, when you board the plane, when you get off the plane, and you go get your rental car and what line you don't get in or do get in. Uh, you get to the hotel and what line you don't get in or do get in. So people who feel like they're being screwed by people with money and power are seeing every single day over and over again how we're not all in this together. And the system is stacked against you. So the inequality really was pronounced and began in a pronounced way in the early 1970s. But then you take, and that trend was continuing all the way through to a fairly well. Then you take the economic crisis of 2008, which is one of the things that people will tell you immediately is there's an economic crisis caused by the elites in this country. Not a single person went to prison. An entire generation of middle class and lower middle class people lost everything. And then you look at the recovery from the 2008 economic crisis, and you see how fast people with money and power recovered and how slow people without money and power didn't recover. Then you had COVID which has accentuated the gap between people, uh, the inequality that you, you know, on your question that you asked, and now that all the free money is gone, uh, and the people that were hit hardest by it uh, have run out of money, um, that gap is getting wider. And if you ask me as an American, like, 
30 years ago, like, well, what's the difference between America and Europe, and why is, why is America so great? My answer would have been, well, it's a land of opportunity. It doesn't matter how you're born, where you're born, who you're born. If you work hard, you can get ahead and have the kind of upper mobility that you'd never have in Europe. Well, right now, Europe is more upperly mobile than America for people. And so it's all getting down to the lottery of where you were born, which is not how you have a great country. So this inequality is widening, and it's done in a way that's a constant reminder to people on, on an hourly basis about how they're getting screwed. So when Trump gets out to the rally and starts throwing red meat out, they totally get that, and that he's channeling their anger. Questions? Um, Please wait till you get the mic. Please make sure there's a question mark at the end of your question. <laughs> right over there, all the way. Well, that wasn't where I pointed, but that's fine. You Sorry, go ahead. I'll, I'll I'm give sure it back. Your just as good. <laughs> Thank you very much for the very insightful presentation. Uh, my name is Brandon Born. I work with the Transatlantic team at the Bautismann Stiftung, a German think tank based here in Berlin. Um, I have a question about one of your last slides. It's the intersection between the primary and convention calendar and the legal odyssey that awaits Trump over the next year. Um, he's the first president, both former or current, who's been charged with, a criminal, with criminal activity, yet that's appeared to not have any effect on his polling thus far. And if, if, if anything, it's emboldened his base. I'm curious if you could, I mean, his legal team, there's reporting that suggests his legal team will be able to obfuscate and push these uh, trial dates back beyond the election. But I'm curious if you could expand a little bit on what impact those trials, what impact you think they'll have on his chances next year. I won't ask you anything about the looming constitutional crisis that potentially awaits should he be elected and subsequently convicted. But if you have thoughts, I'd be curious. Thank you. Well, by the way, <clears throat> the way you started your question, Trump was the first president. You could be able to say that about a million things. I mean, he is the first president to do virtually everything. But if you go back to the slide about like, why you're voting for Trump and the movement and the fact that he's there because of the grassroots, um, I believe that, um, uh, that it is solidifying his hold on the primary because it's a movement. And I do believe, um, uh, and I'll tell you a quick story about 1980 for this, I do believe it's going to cost them in the general election with those target groups I said earlier. So in 1980, uh, Reagan got elected president. Everyone said Reagan is too old. Uh, Carter was ahead in June. He had 37% of the vote, but he was ahead in June. And he lost the election. And what what... The key thing people didn't understand was 37% of the people in June said they were going to vote for Carter, and the 63%, whatever it is, divided their vote between Reagan and a third party with Anderson. But only 37, 38% said they're voting for Carter. That's the vote he got on election day. So as he got closer and closer to the election, the country kept lowering the bar for Reagan. You know, well, well if we have to, if we have to dig a trench to put the bar there, all you got to do is walk across the, tr the, 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 the trench. We're not even asking you to climb the bar. So the worse Carter was doing, the more that they were looking for any excuse to vote for Reagan, because they didn't want to vote for Carter, and they weren't going to waste their vote. So I think that's where we are with Biden, which is they just, he's just got to be able to clear the bar that it's going to be okay. Because I don't think a majority of the people want to take the bet on Trump. In the, in the six states that matter, with the small handful of people that decide who wins and loses the election. Remember in 2000, if, if less than 45,000 people in three states had voted differently, Trump would have gotten reelected. And in 16, if, th if less than 78,000 people in three states had voted for Hillary instead of Trump, she would have been president. So we're really in a th the thin reed right now in an evenly divided country where it's not going to take much to determine who wins and loses. Is that you, Holly? 
Thank you. Uh, I'm Holly Case. I'm a fellow here. Um, my question is about uh, the way I understand your ultimate cause is, is this transition from an industrial economy to a global and a digital one. Um, how would that, in your mind, produce all politics is national? And what relation would it have to the fact that all politics is increasingly zero sum? Well, um, all politics is national right now because we're in this divided country, which is largely, it's been a division that started, you know, last 50 years with the baby boomers who drove America off the highway. And we're still fighting the fights for the last 50 years. Um, uh, so when the baby boomers and Biden and Trump, you know, when they're finally, it's, you know, it's pathetic. You, you, know, you see it with CEOs, you see it with athletes, you see it with politicians. They just never know when to leave the stage. And they just they usually, you know, in politics we say they usually they end up leaving in a box. They either end up in a ballot box losing or they end up in a coffin. Um, but they end, that's how they end up leaving politics. So eventually we're going to get this generation put aside. We're going to be facing the future, not the past. The... Millennials who grew up in the, and Gen Zs who grew up in this world of, of, of seeing how basically the system is rigged. They don't like either party. They don't care about these old fights. And they're reshuffling the deck uh, in terms of how you line up. If you look at how young Republicans, so Harvard did a study of millennials and Gen Zs and compared younger Democrats with older Democrats and younger Republicans with older Republicans. What they found was... Uh, uh, younger Democrats are more similar than dissimilar than older Democrats on issues they care about. What they found on younger Republicans is they have vastly different concerns than older Republicans. And so by the end of this decade, these young people will be the majority of voters. And in those young Republicans, they want more gun control. They want people focused on climate change. Um, and they're going to be much more aligned with younger Democrats as they take over uh, uh, younger people, Democrats have gotten 60% of the young vote in the last four elections. It's not because they like Democrats. They don't like Democrats. They're voting for young people uh, because they're not Republicans. But when we move to a new generation in this country and we're moving forward, not backward, I think you're going to start seeing no longer a zero sum, but a solving of our problems because they actually have more in common, these young people, than you think. Thanks a lot for your crystal clear analysis. You said uh, abortion is a powerful uh, salient issue. Uh, since Trump now delivered three judges on the bench on the highest court, mission accomplished, could that be a hope for Democrats? Now Republicans are not rallied, especially white women who held their noses, voted for Trump because he was for the right for life, made a deal with Leonard Leo and the Christian right. So now on the one side, no urgency. On the other side, people are pushing against it. Is that hope? And what would religion play as a factor? That's a factor I was missing in your analysis. I always saw that religion is the most salient, even more salient than, let's say, uh, education or even income, uh, not religion per se, but how many times people go to church that kind of tells you whether you vote Republican or Democrat. What would happen to that? So let's just stack up the body bags of institutions that have failed Americans. Why don't we start with the Catholic Church? Why don't we move to the Boy Scouts of America? Why don't we move to banks? Why don't we move to government? For half the country, why don't we move to the Supreme Court? So if you look at any measure a, a, a relig, religiosity, I don't know if that's a word. We now as a country have never been less religious. Never as a country have fewer people gone to church. And the people who go to church least are young people because they view that as yet another failed institution. So religion was a very strong correlation of how people voted in the past, but it is not... It's increasingly not a correlation going forward because it's yet another failed institution in these young people's lives. What was the first part of your question? 
abortion. Oh, so, on, on yeah. On one side, there is right. no yeah. to vote for somebody who's right. alive. On the other side, there could be a backlash. So, I, would, I tell Democrats I got good news and bad news for you. Um, the good news is, is the good. I'm not sure you're young enough. So the good news is, uh, this is going to change America politically. The bad news is, most of you here aren't going to see it. So the um, the courts, as an instrument, as I said earlier, the, the politics and, the le and legislation is a lagging indicator of America. Once the line has, once the people have formed. The politicians will get in front of the line and lead. So if you look back to the um, uh, civil rights movement in America and the changing of laws, we essentially made it against the law to legally discriminate against people. And then people just discriminated against them and tried to figure out how not, not, not to get caught legally. But that happened in 64. Well, where did that come from? That came from a 1954 Supreme Court ruling, Brown versus Board of Education. So it took 10 years between the court ruling and how it had a political impact. Now, when Lyndon Johnson signed the civil rights legislation into law, he said to Senator Long from Georgia, this will bring the end of the Democratic Party in the South because the whites are going to react. Now, he's right about that, but it took 25 years before that was fully actualized. So... People are going to see every day the impact of the ruling in real life, particularly in all those red states, right, that they're going in and going extreme. But you, you have to go to the actuarial table of the justices. And when you look at it, you know, this, this, this court could be in place for 25 years. Well, Thomas probably won't be. But they have, they have a cushion, where they can lose Thomas and a Democrat comes in, they still have a working majority. So it'll probably take 20 years before the politics writes itself from what the court did. Mr. Marevchin. Um, Wait a, for the mic. Oh, sorry. I've never followed the instructions. This is the what's the matter with Kansas question. Um, so... If it's true, as you say on your account, that the basic problem here is economic dislocation, globalization, and so on, uh, and people are hurting, then why don't they react as they did in the Great Depression when they became disillusioned with existing institutions and vote for the left that would help them as a result of this change? And the, even if they're not doing it as well as you might hope that they would. And the, the standard explanation for this has to do with a factor you didn't mention at all, which is the role of elites in manipulating people uh, and constructing issues, which changes them away from what their economic interest would be. So I'm wondering if that's your account for why people don't adjust more in the direction of the Democrats in response to the structural change, or you have some other one. Well, there are 26% of the people in America now identify as being a progressive or a liberal, which is higher than it was 21% a few years ago. Well, that leaves you with 74% are either right or they're center. So we're not a leftist country. We never have been. And that ugly chart I showed you shows you that um, people are socially conservative in America, largely. Um, on, on, you know, so... If you th it's a terrible thing to say politically. But. So it's like, first of all, you look at it, everybody hates elites. A bunch of phonies. All these, the, all these liberals go in and worry about climate change and give speeches about it, and they fly their planes, to private planes, to conferences and talk about how awful it is, um, climate change. Um, I think it's shameful, shameful what these Republican governors did of busing these, his, these people who cross the border and bust them to Martha's Vineyard. But when you watch those people get out and you look at those people in Martha's Vineyard are horrified in their backyard, we have a housing crisis in America. Why do we have a housing crisis? Because liberals in cities do everything possible to make sure that you don't have multi-house you multi and dwellings. And, and so they look at liberals as people that have the luxury of lecturing them about all this stuff the way they should be. Everybody hates liberals. 
because they're a bunch of phonies. They live one way and talk another way. And that's why the whole woke thing is so toxic. And the politically correctness is, is, so, is, is a poison for Democrats. And lastly, you know, the, the person who did, the person who, another politically incorrect thing to say, the person who did more damage uh, recent history, the person who did more damage on believing in government was Obama. Because he launched a website that failed, and people said government can't rent health care. The, the person who did the most for people to understand the value of government was Donald Trump. Because when he took away basic functions and people saw what the impact was, they all of a sudden said, well, government's not, not such a bad thing. Maybe we should staff those people over at, at, at the agriculture department, and maybe they should like try eating that meat before they put it on the market, and that way people wouldn't have gotten poisoned. Um, um, but they don't look at government as a solution to fix their problem. And if you look at the Democrats and their problems right now, half of it's the woke stuff, and the other half is the fact that, I mean, basically, when you cut through all of it, basically, Americans hate both parties. They think Republicans are creepy, and they think Democrats are profligate on their spending and don't keep their lives safe. So they look at those choices, and that's why they vote against whoever's in power. Could, uh, if I can just try a refinement on uh, Andy's question. Is it just possible that um, the uh, resentful right lower educate, is, is lower educated, but in fact is still economically well off enough so that they are not really interpreting their miscontent as being <coughs> economic but actually cultural? Well, I mean, you can, it depends on your frame of In reference. Words, they're not, they're not, Unable to put food on their table, as yeah. was the case in the Dust Bowl or the, uh, yeah. in the Great Depression. Well, and I think you, know, you want to compare the standard of living now compared to 50 years ago in America, or you want to compare the standard of living today compared to a person living in Africa, I think they should be feeling pretty damn good. Um, if you go back to, you know, maybe their grand, I mean, there was, the second God-given right as an American, the first was, it didn't matter where you came from, if you worked hard, you could get ahead and be upwardly mobile. The second God-given right as an American was every generation knew the next generation was going to have it better than the previous generation. That was just, everyone knew that. Well, no one believes that anymore. It's like two to one, people say it's going to be worse in the future than it is now. There's, I mean, we got now have expensive money. We now have uh, no inventory. How, how's any young person going to buy a house? And then you take the, you know, we have a um, you know, 3% increase in cost of living and 4.5% increase in inflation. I mean, they're, they're on, the, people, the, these people you're asking, they're on a hamster wheel and, and they're turning the speed up and they're not getting ahead. And that's driving their psyche and, and, uh, uh, and they're not wrong, I think, in terms of, they're feeling like they've lost control of their lives. And that, in fact, there's a system out there that's screwing them. Christoph. Thank you. Christoph Marshall. I'm working for the Tagesspiegel and have been reporting from the States for many years. I would like to get back to your three-option model. In two of the three cases, Biden loses only if the Democrats, the White House, make it the election about Biden, uh, uh, sorry, uh, of course, about Trump, then they have a chance. If you were the advisor, how do you do that? How, what, what, what is a practical way how you make it about Trump? Is it an active way in doing so? Is it enough to avoid that the two other options are on the forefront? And just one observation, it seems that the indictments don't play any role. I mean, here we would have thought, oh, you know, once they get him and once he's in court, that would have an impact. It has no impact because the people who believe in Trump, they don't care or they just uh, use media which not makes the indictment a subject and on the other side, it's the same. So how do you win over people? Who, who do you have to cater to? This is about Trump, not about Biden or a comparison of the two presidencies and who is more competent. So I have some experience with that, being in the Clinton White House, where in 
June of 95, 62% of the people said they would never consider voting for Clinton. That, that, was, that wasn't a great meeting that day. So the, what I would do is the following. I'm kind of covering some of the ground I said before. The first thing this White House has got to do is make Biden more right with the public. And, you know, that thing I told you about earlier about Reagan, they kept lowering the bar. So the first thing I got to do is clean Biden up so that people feel better about him. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by having a clear narrative and a clear story and saying it over and over and over and over again. And I think they have to do a better job of managing the optics of how he moves around. Every, every White House has a third rail that you can never touch. So in the Clinton second term, the third rail, rail was um, uh, that impeachment might have impended, impinged on Clinton's ability to govern. So at some point they say, well, you know, it's not really right, but we need a full-time president. So even though we probably shouldn't get rid of him, we probably should get rid of him because we really can't afford to have a part-time president. So our third rail was to never, ever get caught that impeachment was impacting how he operated as president. This White House's third rail uh, is um, age. And I don't think they've done a very good job of building around. So you, you take Bush in, 80, Bush in 04. So that was a perfect example of an old saying, if you have a political problem, what do you do about it? You focus on it. So you had John Kerry, who said he was a war hero, Vietnam. And you had Bush, who he was one of these guys I was talking about earlier, right? He, he was fighting on the front lines of Vietnam at a, at a naval base in Alabama that his father got for him. So what did Bush do about the issue of Vietnam? He said, well, we're going to make that the issue of the campaign. Do you want to talk about Vietnam, Kerry? Let's talk about Vietnam. So they leaned in on it because it's the elephant in the room. And I think they should be leaning in on the age in the sense that you can't do anything about it. Don't pretend like it's not there to try to frame it on your own terms. So the most important thing is, is it, this is the, the shrinking of the president. When, when Carter was president, the whole conversation in America was like, well, maybe the job is too big for one man. Maybe we need two people to do it because he's not up to it. Because he didn't, underst he didn't understand, which Reagan did, the, val the, the, the power of the bully pulpit. The White House could be a really important job or it can be not an important job. And Biden, as I mentioned earlier, got elected without a base and is, isn't capable and has never been really of effectively using the power of the bully. He used the power of the bully pulpit this past week on a speech about Israel, which got great reviews across the board. People hated him. That's an example. That's an example of the power of the office if you use it right. So to summarize, you got to you got to manage the optics. You got to manage the narrative. You got to tell a story. You got to focus on those six states. And then, because you get elected president, they're like, want you to do a job as president. When you're talking about governing, they think you're talking about them. When you're talking about politics and getting reelected, they think you're talking about yourself. So the public's a lot more interested in them and what you're doing for them than they are hearing about you trying to keep your job. So all the negative Trump stuff should be outside the White House, should be done by third parties, should be ripping the bark off the trees of him. It should be in those six states. It should be targeted on choice to non-college white women. And it should be targeted towards college white voters in those states. They should be going after independent voters and people who live in the suburbs. And raise the bar enough that people can say, I don't like Biden, but my God, I can't vote for Trump. Last question, right here. Thank you. Uh, Michael Fichter. Uh, thanks for a very uh, comprehensive analysis of these domestic factors. Uh, but my question is, uh, doesn't foreign policy play a role at, at all? I mean, right now, in this world of crisis that we're facing, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it could be all of these issues. It could make or break Biden with uh, what's going on in the, in the world. And the other, other quick uh, part of that question is, uh, what about the implosion of the Republican Party in, this, in the House? 
I mean, that whole chaos there, is that going to have any effect on this? I, I think it can. Uh, and, you know, um, you know, if we were up here two weeks ago, it would be a little bit of a different conversation than it is today. And, you know, we're 13 months away. We're, we have 26 increments of two weeks ago. <laughs> Between now and or fifty six, whatever it's fifty two, so I will say this, and I have absolutely no uh, basis for this, but I just feel it in my bones. So on the one hand, I've never uh, uh, seen anything like this before, right? I've been doing this for over forty years. On the other hand, I said, well, what does this remind me of most? And the answer to me is the nineteen sixty eight presidential election. So in October of 1967, Johnson was president. Uh, he was running for re-election. And Nixon was making his way through, quite, quite sure what was going to happen. And um, Johnson, uh, the last day of March of 68, announced to the country in a complete surprise that he's not running for re-election. And I just have a sense that what we're doing right now is not sustainable in terms of the way the election looks. Um, so I ponder that. And back to your more specific on foreign policy. Uh, I think, as I said earlier, I think that the two things people care about is security, personal security and economic security. And I would put foreign policy and what's related around it is, is, is personal security. America is very xenophobic. Um, uh, you know, it took Roosevelt like uh, two years, three years to like figure out a way to get the country to at least agree to go to war. Um, Forty-five percent of the country doesn't like any more money in Ukraine. Uh, it's truly an America first view. I think you can look at Ukraine and what's going on with the Russians and actually it depends on how Biden does. And he's done a really good job in the last week with Israel. But, you know, you can Trump can make an argument. Well, I was president. We didn't have these problems. And the fact of the matter was. People were scared to death of him and didn't want to call his bluff. But he could make a pretty good argument that the world was a more orderly place when he was president. So it's really going to depend on how Biden handles all of this. But going back to what I said earlier, a vote for Biden in 2020 was a vote for bringing life back to normal, bringing the adults in the room, and creating a sense of people getting more control of their lives. So anything that happens that runs counter to that is running counter to the rationale of why people voted for Biden. So I think it's, I don't think it's clear, but I think it creates even more anxiety in the American public about the state of our country. And you look at the, you know, gas prices, my God, you, you look at, um, one last thing I'll say. So like the stock market is priced in in America, that we have a dysfunctional government, and life seems to go on, just like we're in Italy. You know, 44 governments in 43 years. Um, I think that uh, the market hasn't priced in the fact that when you have a government that doesn't work, and you have a global tinderbox, it's probably the worst we've seen since World War II, I don't think that the business and stock market and people in, Washington, in America, I don't think they've priced in the actual price of political instability and dysfunctional government. And I don't think when people voted for Brexit, they priced in everything. So I think that we're in our whole brave new world, uh, and I think it does matter, uh, but it rolls back to where people are, which is more xenophobic and more about their own lives back, back in the States. Okay, Doug, thanks for a terrific and depressing tour d'horizon. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, maybe I won't uh, travel the world with you after all. But um, I'd like to invite you all to our, our next event, which will be this Thursday, October 19th, when we will welcome uh, the CEO of the New America. Um, I guess we don't say New America Foundation. We just say New America. Okay. Uh, when we will welcome the CEO of New America and our fall 2023 Richard Holbrook Fellow, Anne-Marie Slaughter, uh, who will discuss care and capitalism. And you should come back and, and listen to that because it might, you know. Anyway, uh, we look forward 
to uh, learning about her research uh, that reimagines a more holistic approach to human needs and desires and offers a potential transformation for a more balanced and rewarding future uh, that might not actually be possible in a second Trump administration. So uh, for more information, uh, check our website, and I hope you will come, and thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you.